gallery. <laughs> Help him out. Yeah, I think so. I think that's the story. Uh, oh, because be he was Swedish and they were Swedish. And yeah. yeah, he was Swedish, but yeah. he became spent his whole life. How are you doing it, Carl? He was very, kind of pretty protective of heritage. Uh, yeah. In the, in the Swedish thing, he made the really comment that Lynch Bird was more Swedish than most Swedish. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. I'm Kurt. Tim Reimer. Tim Reimer. Kurt. 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 Oh, yeah, I can't make it up. Um, Here's the house. But as you see, the outside has been remodeled. Uh, it has plastic siding, which is you know, inappropriate. The porch has been changed. But uh, so uh, it's not at this stage. It's not really eligible to be on the national register. Yes, but this building is <coughs> eligible, and no one has pursued that. And so uh, not yet. Not yet. But uh, I think. Uh, Corey and Ron are going to look into it since, you know, it's all, they've always been reluctant or didn't know whether they had the right to pursue it because it doesn't belong mm -hmm. to the foundation. It belongs to the college. Mm -hmm. so, so do we know when this building was built? Uh, yes, it was built in several stages. Uh, just a moment. And the, uh, I will warn you that there's been some flooding with some heavy rains lately, and the water comes in from the alley, and mm. it got up into mm. the studio just a little bit. Mm. Uh, no harm was done, really, except to the floor. The floor has some warp, uh, some buckling in it, so I ask you to all be very careful when you step in, and uh, look where you step. They moved the, they moved some furniture to. Uh, Make sure the worst of it won't be walked on. So come on in. When you were asking about when this was built, when it was built, and I have a flyer about that. It's great. The, uh, the first part of the building is the west part, and now you're coming up to the mm -hmm. windows mm -hmm. here. And that was uh, just kind of a walkout. Yes. And Charlie, there's a book right here. Do we have yeah. everyone in? I'll shut this. Keep the room cool. And that, it was built in 1907. And then the storage room, that part, the south part, was built in 1913. And the rest was added in uh, this part over here was added in 1930. So just before the establishment of the Prairie Printmakers. So he had a nicely refurbished studio to show to everyone. Uh, 
Now you're turning over, are you looking for a water damage in the rug? No, I'm just looking to weed. Now this was made by uh, uh, an artist at the Cranbrook Academy. Um, her first name is Maya, now I can't think of her last name. I will tell you in a moment. Maya Verde. Should have remembered that. Because <laughs> it uh, sounds like a Spanish name, but the Maya part is not Spanish. The Verde part is. <laughs> but she was uh, an artist at the Cranbrook Academy in Michigan, and he probably got to know, uh, they probably got to know her through Carmilla, who also uh, worked at the Cranbrook Academy. His name was a good friend, Carmilla. And uh, you may have noticed the little Triton fountain as we left the, the gallery and went to the That was given by Carl Miller to Tanzane and some of his fellow professors at Bethany College uh, in 1935. And the, uh, the fountain used to be here in the, in the yard of the studio. And when they built the gallery in 1957, it was moved over there. So uh, usually if, um, when I give a tour here, I'm usually talking to children. <laughs> and I ask them just to look around and see what conclusions they can draw about Tang Zane and his interests. Mm -hmm. um, quite varied. <laughs> quite varied, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the some of the books, you'll get some ideas about what he was interested in and also his ability in languages. Tang Zane can or at least knew six languages. Uh, he was very musical. Uh, he played the guitar, and some of those skills are transferable to mandolin. Uh, as far as we know, he didn't really play the mandolin. It was more of a prop or a decorative item. But uh, he did play the guitar, mm -hmm. and he uh, he was a good singer. He uh, sang the tenor solo in the Messiah for ten years. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so he did have musical ability. Uh, when he first came here, he also taught some guitar. Uh, when, when he first came, uh, Sam Singh was born in 1871. He came to America uh, because uh, when he was studying in Paris, he uh, heard from other art students there about opportunities in America and specifically about Lindsborn, Kansas. Uh, so he wrote a letter to the president of the college and asked for a job. He got the job. He came here in 1894. And the first thing he got to teach were languages, mm -hmm. uh, German and Swedish and Spanish, mm -hmm. and also fencing. You see the fencing foils over here? Mm -hmm. uh, he was taught fencing as part of his physical education, going through school, and so he was able to teach fencing as a physical education class here at Bethany College when he first started out. Did he uh, fashion the metal? I see some metal stuff over there. Did he? No, was he a forger or something? No, or? he did not do uh, any metal work. At least I don't know the specifics on these, but they were most probably a gift. Okay. Someone. Okay. Um, but he liked to surround himself with beautiful things in his studio to create a nice atmosphere. Uh, you may notice uh, some of the Asian art figures in here. He was very interested in Asian art and would probably trace this uh, to his his boarding school, uh, where he stayed in his boarding school. They went to boarding school at the age of 10 in Sparrow, Sweden, and there was a, an academy there. He stayed with an aunt, and the aunt uh, had Asian art. Uh, collections and had an antique shop. So I think that's where that budding interest came from. And then in later years, he was a, an acquaintance of uh, Gordon McSane from Hawkins Point of City, Oklahoma. He traveled the world as a photographer and he acquired a lot of Asian art. And Sam Zane would trade paintings for Asian art. So that's where a lot of this came from. The large uh, uh, Japanese figures and the lotus bowl that are in the courtyard, they, they came uh, uh, 
to the gallery by way of Helen Greeno and Jane son But he, he really enjoyed the Asian art, and that's, that's how he acquired a lot of it. And that is why Ponte City has one of the, I think, the second largest collection of Tanzanian art, because all of uh, Matt Sainz's work, is just, uh, Matt Sainz's collection, is displayed in the city library. So there's another project for you. Van Sainz is here. And I would say this is in the late 30s, probably. This man here is Carl Peterson, who was the director of the San Fan Gallery until he retired uh, in 1981, I believe. He died in the 1950s? Uh, San Fan died in 1954. And the gallery was built in 1957. And uh, his daughter and his son-in-law and his wife are responsible for the building. And here we have them standing. This is Margaret Greeno, your daughter, Santane, and Alfreda, his wife. Uh, you will see the, uh, the Swedish Christmas tree. Uh, of course, he has Swedish heritage because he was born in Sweden. Uh, no, these, uh, these were brought from Sweden by uh, Margaret in the early 30s and sort of started a craze, and so everybody in Lunchburg started making those. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was uh, one, of the, one of the first ones. What did they put right on this site? Apples? Apples. Apple rings? Or the whole apple? The whole apple. Mm. Stuff that Some people them. would put on donuts. Oh. Or something like uh -huh. that. But they're, they're apple trees. They're known as apple trees. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people could help themselves to the apples. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a fall and Christmas kind of decoration. Here we've arrived at San mm -hmm. desk. It usually sits in kind of a different place, but it's covering, covering a warp or a floorboard kind of buckled there. Mm -hmm. You see these, these are his actual paint brushes and palette. This is his paint as he left it. And the uh, very large brushes are what he used to create the large brush strokes and the highly textured surfaces, the thick and top soap on the painting. A lot of people, for some reason, assume these were done with palette knife, but he never used palette knife. But he tried it once or twice. You can see some uh, some very early paintings that had some evidence of palette knife, but they were really all done with large brush strokes, using large brushes. And this is his emigrant truck, what he had his whole belongings in when he immigrated to America in 1894. And uh, it has a very simple address because uh, life wasn't that complicated in his <laughs> uh, You can see uh, this large mural. Uh, have you been to the post office? Yes, you know. This is kind of along the lines of what you see in the early 20s. They in 1939 for Belleville, but they sent him the wrong dimensions. So when he got there, it didn't fit. They had not allowed for a couple of girls, which was a name option for the painting. So uh, that one came home, and he made another one that would fit in place. And there was another mural in Hillsboro post office. So, uh, so the question was that where, where he did so many smoky little river scenes, were, were there certain places that we know he went to for the view? Uh, well, I, you know, all, all up, you know, probably mostly in the county. He did go quite a lot out to Graham County in western Kansas. The Lexell family, his wife's family, owned land out there. So one of our favorite paintings, uh, Wild Horse Creek, uh, uh, Moonrise, uh, uh, over the over the mm -hmm. creek, is uh, there displayed in the main gallery, mm -hmm. and it is painted in, from a drawing he did in Graham County. So uh, and that is not that's not a river, but but it uh, shows a springtime flood, so it's uh, that is one location, you know, 
anywhere along the river here in in Central Kansas could been. I don't think he had specific places, although he did do sketches uh, that he used over and over again. Uh, and he might make a print, he might make a, a watercolor, he might make an oil painting, all I mean, all from the same sketch. He would paint outside. He may have done watercolors outside. Mostly he did sketches mm -hmm. and he would label them what color went where and so forth. And then when he got back home, he would enlarge them on canvas and, and fill them in. And he was very methodical. Uh, he, a lot of people say, oh, he's an Impressionist. Well, he was too methodical to be an Impressionist because he'd draw the sketch, he, he knew he had all the painted areas labeled. He would start at the top left and work across and down, just like you do when you're <laughs> writing. And so, and when he got to the bottom, he was done. He did not go back and rework things. He did not muddle around. He had it all figured out ahead of time. And so, because he had done the sketches, because he'd done the sketches, and he thought about it. Mm -hmm. So you can't call him an impressionist, uh, more of an uh, expressionist, I would say. So. Uh, Anyway, there are three of these three girls. He also did large altar paintings, a number of those. Those do not reflect his style, really, because churches were more conservative. So they just wanted kind of some simple forward kind of painting. But a lot of paintings in, in this area, a lot of churches in this area do have altar paintings. Yeah, so, yeah there is one church that has large, um, traditional, Sacred subject matter. That's the church over here. Yes. Uh, yes, it has uh, scenes from Bethany. Uh, it has the uh, raising of Lazarus, and it has uh, ascension, and then uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, altar painting itself is painted by Jean and mm -hmm. So, uh, but they are very traditional things. In a few churches, you can see they break out of the box a little bit. Thank you.